other geographs and governments, the Sea of the Orient. And the title of the conference is What Lies Ahead for the South China Sea Disputes After the Hague Tribunal Ruling. Actually, we have organized a similar conference three years ago, uh, and that was at a time uh, when we uh, had already the ruling of the arbitral tribunal of the sea of the permanent court of the Hague, which had been issued in July 2016. And this ruling had actually rejected, dismissed nearly all of the claims of the Chinese government on the South China Sea. We have here some very distinguished guests. Mr. Bill Hayton, Associate Fellow with the Asia Pacific Program, Chatham House. He is also a reputed reporter, journalist at the BBC. And I remember having seen a film in which he had participated regarding Vietnam, the Vietnam War. We have here also Professor Eric Franks of the Freie Universität Brussels, Belgium. Dr. Teresa Fallon, founder and director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies in Brussels. Dr. Nicola Casarini, senior fellow at the Istituto Affari Internazionali of Italy and visiting professor at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. Dr. Felix Hajduk, German Institute for International and Security Affairs, Germany. And finally, Captain James Fennell. Uh, he's living in Switzerland, but he had a distinguished career in the US Navy. He uh, is uh, working also with the Global Fellowship Initiative and the Center for Security Policy here in Geneva. They are all specialists in various fields, diplomacy, legal, international public law, and of course, also regarding the military aspects. Though being at the center of territorial and maritime disputes for decades, the July 2016 arbitral tribunal ruling in this landmark case between the Philippines, who was the claimant state, and China, failed to change much in the South China Sea. It has been observed that China has continued to challenge the rules-based order in the era through building seven artificial islands with their military facilities and weapon system, drilling for oil and gas, and chasing off its Southeast Asian neighbors' fishing vessels from waters where they have the rights to fish pursuant to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, and the Hague Tribunal ruling. In the modern area, China has been one of the world's greatest beneficiaries of rules designed to promote global security and economic openness. China, however, is using its growing reach in all aspects, financial, economic, military, political, to discard or change these rules as it sees fit, seeking 
an approach of might makes right. There is this difference between the force of the law and the law of the force, and apparently China is using the second approach. Against this background, this conference will provide opportunities for in-depth discussions and analysis of the future of the South China Sea disputes after three years of the Hague, Convention, Hague Arbitral Tribunal ruling. It will feature the international speakers whom I introduced addressing the roles and limits of international law to make a meaningful contribution to a rules-based global order in a battleground of norms in the South China Sea. Seeking policy options to counter China's assertive expansion strategy under the so-called salami slicing and cabbage, cabbage strategy activities for incrementally gaining a greater degree of control over land features, waters, and airspace in the South China Sea, and discovering international and regional cooperation mechanism in order to govern the sustainability of the South China Sea. The speakers will address the specific themes in which they are specialists. South China Sea ruling remains a battleground for the rules-based order. The fact is that the Chinese government has, of course, when this arbitral award was issued, has just stated through its uh, speaker of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that this arbitral award was just good for the dustbin of history. Uh, China also had not recognized the jurisdiction, the competence of the arbitral tribunal. So later, of course, the Chinese government has decided to review and contest the ruling of the arbitral tribunal to contest specifically various legal aspects of the award so that the Chinese Society of International Law had prepared the ground uh, some time ago uh, in supporting the position of the Chinese government in a rather long newspaper article in which the, this Chinese society justified the government's position that the 2016 final award is null and void, will be null and void. They did even a more thorough job two years later where, when they published a rather lengthy legal analysis of both awards on jurisdiction, the first one, as well as on the merits, spread out over 540 pages in the Chinese Journal of International Law, concluding that the many errors of the award deprive, it, deprive them of any validity. The, the fact is that the Chinese government, uh, with which, of course, all the neighboring governments have an interest to entertain good, a good relationship, is not really open to a constructive dialogue and is increasing its military might in the South China Sea. We will uh, learn from some of the speakers about the China, about China's behavior in the South China Sea. We will see that actually there was no fundamental change in the principle of the Chinese activities in this region except that they have increased their military presence. And uh, we will also talk about China's maritime strategy and the possible options to counter this strategy and the necessity 
to counter this strategy, uh, which uh, is a liability of the various nations involved in this region, uh, the United States, Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, India, and also, and we should not forget it, the European, nation, uh, European Union has also an interest to secure peace in this region. The fact is that there is a growing militarization of the South China Sea. And uh, every day you have small incidents with the Chinese Navy attacking Philippine or Vietnamese fishermen. You have problems when uh, battleships of the US or of other countries uh, go through this region which is claimed as a sovereign territory or sovereign waters of China. Actually, China is claiming a real monopoly of the South China Sea. The action of China is ignoring international law. And the fact is that for the Chinese government, the only applicable law is their own law. And the only applicable principle to which they feel liable is their own sovereignty. In these conditions, there is a risk of incident with many countries, and not only the United States, who want to secure the South China Sea as a free sea, where you can go through, you can fish, you can exercise the freedom granted by the laws of the sea. The recent, uh, there have been some recent incidents in this region and uh, I think the governments should be aware of the situation and uh, of course to counter China's attitude you have the possibility of speaking at the United Nations or in other forum, in ASEAN and so on. But it is, in our view, the liability of the international community and the uh, powers uh, which are involved and have an interest in peace and in this region of the Pacific to take actions also, uh, strong actions on the political and military side. I now give the word to Mr. Bill Hayton and he will explain to you precisely what is the subject of his presentation. Thank you. Shall I change the presentation here? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to uh, Pierre for the invitation. Um, what I will try to do is introduce the topic, recent developments, 
and I will touch, I think, on many of the uh, subjects that my colleagues on the panel will look at in more detail, but maybe I will just provide some context uh, for you all. Um, I'm going to look at these four things uh, in particular, um, just showing you how things have developed over the past year or so, um, and maybe offer some suggestions to how you know, some likely developments uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, on the surface, it may appear that things are quiet in the South China Sea at the moment. Um, we have very few reports of physical clashes between uh, the rival claimant states or with, with outside uh, powers. Um, we have talks continuing between ASEAN and China on a code of conduct and uh, regional diplomacy meetings between governments and so forth all appears to carry on as normal. Yet, underneath, there are a series of worrying developments. So, for example, uh, Vietnam was forced to cancel uh, some oil drilling uh, under Chinese pressure. We see Chinese uh, maritime militia boats swarming around the largest uh, Philippine-held island, Titu or Pagasa. We've seen threats to passing warships, uh, American but also British, and really the code of conduct uh, negotiations are in a circular motion, going in a circular motion at the moment. Um, so um, I want to look at, um, in particular, at ways that uh, China's actions have been infringing the rights of uh, the other coastal states, in particular their rights to resources uh, in, the, um, in their own exclusive economic zones. Now, I imagine Eric might think my map here is a bit simplistic, um, but what I wanted to show was really the difference that the arbitration uh, ruling made. So you see on the left-hand side the... Um, uh, the outline of China's uh, nine dash or U-shaped line, um, which has always been vague, we didn't know what it meant, but the arbitration uh, panel when it ruled in 2016 basically said that the, this line could never be a claim on maritime resources. So in effect what we have, and it, of course it only ruled on the Spratleys and Scarborough Shoal in the south and the east of the South China Sea. It made no ruling on the Paracels or, or, or Pratas Island up in the north, but if I just use the same basic principles. So basically what you're left with is, the, the, on the right-hand side, is really China's legitimate economic zone, and that's predicated on the idea that Taiwan would be part of a, a Chinese state in the future, and Pratas as well. Um, but what it really means is that you just see the, the dark blue circles down in the bottom. These are 12 nautical mile circles around tiny little reefs and rocks and, and islets. Those are the only bits of disputed territory now. Uh, in the eyes of international law, and countries in the southern part of the South China Sea have the right to the resources up to 200 nautical miles away from their coast. That's what should be going on, but unfortunately is not. Um, so here's an example where Vietnam has found itself in trouble um, with the uh, Spanish-owned company Repsol trying to drill in the very uh, bottom, you see in the yellow zone there, close to the bottom of the, of the, the picture there, Two uh, wells were planned. Uh, one was suspended in June 2017 and the other suspended in March last year. Um, these are at the very edge of Vietnam's claimed exclusive economic zone and both uh, drills were cancelled under, I'm told by people in the oil industry, uh, under Chinese gov uh, government pressure. Um, uh, the Russian-owned company Rosneft is also worried about another block um, uh, not too far away as well. Rosneft took over that, um, that block from BP a few years ago. Um, and it's just worth looking perhaps at, at the, how this intimidation happened in March last year, the sequence of events. Uh, so, the, I mean, what I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting that there's a direct connection here, but what I have is a series of events which do seem to me to be significant. Um, the Vietnamese government invited the American aircraft carrier, the Carl Vinson, to go to Da Nang, at the beginning of March, um, it ex took part in exercises, including with the Japanese forces in the South China Sea, and in mid-March then left the South China Sea through the Luzon Strait. A few days later, the Chinese aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, uh, entered the South China Sea and assembled a, a, with a flotilla of around 40 Chinese naval vessels off the island of Hainan, uh, which is about two days sailing from where the uh, oil drill was planned for. And a day or so after that, uh, Repsol announced that its drill was going to be cancelled. And then a few days after that, you see this satellite photograph, which I've shown here, and right in the middle, under the, above the word Liaoning, you can actually see 
the aircraft carrier, the, the flotilla formed up uh, for a big photo op with 40 ships, um, just to demonstrate, I think, a show of strength in the South China Sea. This, to me, seems to have been a deliberate act of coercion against the uh, Vietnam's plans to, uh, to drill for oil at the edge of its exclusive economic zone. Um, there is another project which may uh, encounter some difficulty, although I think uh, that this one is probably just in the right part of the sea to avoid it, which is ExxonMobil is drilling for gas off uh, central Vietnam. It's a very large field known in English as the Blue Whale. Um, you can see the, the, the gray line there that shows about a sort of 50 nautical miles, uh, 100 kilometer distance. Uh, so this is not very far off the Vietnamese coast. Now the red line that I've sort of drawn in by hand on there is approximately the location of one of the dashes of China's nine dash line. So you can see that it, from my very shaky calculations, this appears to be just outside um, uh, any potential, even illegal, uh, Chinese claim. So Exxon may not be under so much pressure, but as I say, this is a very approximate um, guess on my part. Um, so it may well be, I mean, ExxonMobil has stood up to Chinese pressure in the past off Vietnam um, and will probably try and do so again. Uh, there are delays to this project, but they're mainly to do with commercial negotiations between Exxon and the Vietnamese government. Uh, and you can see here that the actual shape of the U-shaped line is very uh, imprecise. So the map that China published in 1947, this, is, this rendition here was produced by the U.S. State Department. The green dashes were the State Department's rendition of the 1947 version of the map. And you can see the dashes much more closer to the middle of the sea than a different map which was sent to the UN in 2008, where the red dashes you see are closer to the coastlines of the neighboring states. This, I think, gives you some idea about how vague, imprecise, and arbitrary China's U-shaped uh, line claim is in the South China Sea. Um, one of the concerns that I have is the implications for the South China Sea disputes on internal stability, politics, and economics in uh, the coastal states. So this, I think, is a good example. Uh, Vietnam is being hit by a uh, fall in oil revenue. Obviously, the oil prices themselves are falling, but Vietnam's production of oil has fallen at the same time. So Vietnam's, I think it's down sort of 20 percent over the last, from the last three years. Um, so that means that the government's um, uh, income is being hit directly. And this is money that would have gone into the government budget to support um, regional development and so forth. Uh, the government is having to find alternative sources for that, uh, which will mean increases in taxation, rising uh, government debt, and so forth. Um, the Philippines is also facing problems. Uh, the Malampaya gas field, as you can see on, on the, the, the right-hand side, um, provides around about 20% of the electricity that's generated in the Philippines. It's expected to run out within, start to run out within five years. Um, what is the Philippines going to do to replace one-fifth of its national electricity supply? There's a lot of gas under the Reed Bank in the, uh, more, more towards the center of the South China Sea. And the point of the arbitration ruling was to make sure that the Philippines had the clear legal right to develop that gas, and the arbitration tribunal agreed with them. But China has explicitly, according to President Duterte, threatened military action if the Philippines goes ahead and unilaterally develops that gas under the Reed Bank. Um, you can see just how dependent the Philippines is on the Malampaya gas field from this, uh, from this pie chart here. Uh, almost a, you know, just almost a quarter, just over a fifth. Um, and the Philippines still hasn't taken any decisions on how it's going to replace this electricity supply. Um, interestingly, one of President Duterte's uh, business colleagues uh, is currently in discussions with the Chinese um, uh, offshore oil company, Sinuk, uh, to import natural gas into the Philippines and to set up an import terminal. So you have this interesting position whereby one of Mr. Duterte's uh, friends, um, donors, um, would actually prefer to see the Philippines not develop its uh, rights to offshore exclusive uh, off offshore resources uh, because it would be in his business interests for, Vietnam, for, for, the, for the Philippines to have to import gas uh, from, from outside. An interesting contradiction. Um, 
China and the Philippines in November last year did sign a memorandum of understanding on some kind of joint offshore oil and gas development. Now, it's very unclear exactly what this means. My understanding from having spoken to a few people is that the Philippines is trying to call it joint development, i.e. an agreement between governments, while in reality it's actually going to be a joint venture, i.e. an agreement between uh, commercial companies uh, under Philippine sovereignty. But I'm not sure whether China will be willing to, um, to go down that route. China seems to be holding out for uh, a declaration that in fact these areas are, could be under joint sovereignty. Um, but the problem I know, is that that would violate UNCLOS and also provisions of the Philippines Constitution and its national laws. Moving ahead to fishing, um, I mean, it's clear that overfishing uh, and loss of access to some of the fishing areas is having an uh, implication for individual uh, livelihoods, for families, for, for, for fishing villages and so forth around the South China Sea. Um, this will have impacts in terms of poverty, malnutrition, migration and so forth. Um, and if uh, com countries are not able to uh, process and export um, fisheries, then there will be impacts on national budgets uh, and uh, other problems as well going outside. We're seeing increasing numbers of um, fishermen being detained in other countries' exclusive economic zones. Um, at the, there's been a lot of publicity recently about Vietnamese uh, fishermen found off the Philippines, off Malaysia. Um, uh, in March, we had a, a case where um, a Vietnamese fishing boat was rammed and sunk uh, with people on it, uh, apparently by a Chinese vessel off the Paracels. Um, so these clashes are ongoing, they're routine, often they don't get reported, um, but uh, they are you know, a constant presence and a reminder that these, these clashes uh, are taking place. And they're really, I think, we need to look at the, the way that state subsidies towards fishermen of all countries, um, but mainly China, also Vietnam to some extent, are encouraging uh, fishermen to keep uh, going to further and further afield, um, and we have increased poaching. Um, some of the prospects for fisheries in the South China Sea are pretty alarming. You can see that, uh, according to this um, estimate, from the Sea Around Us project, which is run out of the University of British Columbia, uh, we're you know, kind of where, it, you know, where, where fish catches are already starting to tail off in the South China Sea. Um, we need you know, overfishing, you know, potentially catastrophic consequences. Um, Indonesia's response has been dramatic. And we may have seen the pictures of Indonesia blowing up boats in the past. Now they don't blow them up. Now they fill them with water and sink them. Uh, in May this year, um, uh, a further 51 vessels, I think, were sunk. Um, so it's make bringing a total of more than 500 since uh, October five years ago. Um, but the Indonesian government seems very happy with the result. It claims that the quarterly catch being um, declared by Indonesian fishermen has risen from 5.5 million tonnes to more than 6 million tonnes in the same period. So they're very determined, you might say, aggressive defence of uh, their exclusive economic zone seems to be paying off for them. Um, there's been a, there was a clash recently between, uh, a physical clash between the Coast Guards of Vietnam and Indonesia. Um, I've got this map sent to me by an Indonesian expert, uh, Andy Asana. Um, so it's, uh, I quite liked his little kind of uh, graphic here, to, which explains how and why the problem is. The problem is that there's a difference between the two countries have agreed a continental shelf boundary, i.e. the uh, or, or the sea floor boundary, but they haven't agreed an exclusive economic zone boundary between them. So there's a kind of a there's a disputed area, as this uh, will show. So that's what Vietnam and uh, uh, the, so Indonesia and its neighbours have agreed in terms of the seabed boundary, uh, there like that. Um, but that's Vietnam's 200 nautical mile potential exclusive economic zone, and you can see there's an overlap. Um, that and then that's potentially Indonesia's. 200 nautical mile zone claimed from the tuna. Again, you can see there's an overlap. Um, so the boundary claim is this sort of disputed area in between. So that's this area here is different between the seabed and the surface of the sea, if you like. And so the clashes that we saw between Indonesia and Vietnam took place, uh, this was in April, took place in, in this part of the sea. Uh, so there are still unresolved issues even between the, the ASEAN states. Um, 
something that we thought we'd seen the back of has come back. Uh, Chinese uh, clam harvesting is back with a vengeance, uh, taking place at Scarborough Shoal, uh, using um, either engines, propellers to dig up the coral reef and so they can extract the giant clams or a new method of using high-powered hoses, uh, which um, explicitly goes against the arbitration tribunal, which found that China had been uh, responsible for environmental destruction. Um, we know very clearly who's doing this. These are fishing boats from the uh, town of Tanmen on Hainan Island. There's a very uh, developed uh, uh, um, giant clam um, uh, sort of uh, shell industry based there. Um, and it's interesting, I think, to think, to remember that when this happened before, uh, back in 2015, that sort of period, that was often a prelude for uh, China then building on these reefs. They were destroyed by these fishermen who extracted the giant clams and then the concrete was poured and they became bases. And now we see things starting to happen at Scarborough Shoal. Is this some kind of prelude to, uh, to uh, some kind of construction on Scarborough Shoal? A little look at the question of freedom of navigation now, moving on, still kind of within the rubric of sort of international law. Um, and it's worth maybe a reminder you know, that China has signed the, the collision regulations and UNCLOS, but its 1992 law on the territorial sea is in direct contradiction to uh, what it signed up to in UNCLOS. So UNCLOS says that all ships, and it makes no distinction between civilian and military, have the right of innocent passage through a country's territorial sea. So pretty much any ship can sail anywhere it likes in general. There will be some exceptions. China's law, which was passed... Um, you know, only, you know, which was passed a decade after it uh, signed UNCLOS, explicitly goes against that, saying that foreign ships will require permission to, military ships will require permission to enter the territorial sea. And this is the real nub of the difference between, uh, between China and the U.S. on this question. Um, in September last year, we saw the USS Decatur almost hit by a, a Chinese warship, and you can see the courses uh, of the, the two warships here. You can see the, the USS uh, Decatur is the blue line, and you can see the sharp angle that the Chinese ship took to, to uh, almost collide with it. Um, and it's worth, this is a bit of video that was uh, shot by the, um, um, from the American ship, and you can see how close uh, the Chinese warship um, is. Uh, there's, there's audio on the clip, and you can hear the sailors saying that the, you can, when, the, when the camera zooms in, you can see that the front of the warship has got, as we would say in English, boys or in American buoys uh, out on the ship because it clearly is intending to ram the, uh, the, 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 uh, the American ship here. Um, and uh, the closest these two ships came was possibly as close as uh, 40 meters, something like that. This is very unsafe uh, maneuvering, to say the very least. Um, so, you know, this is not behaving in accordance with uh, international law, to say the very least. Um, other states are taking a greater interest in these questions. Uh, these, the ship in the middle is HMS Albion, Royal Navy ship from the UK. The two ships either side are both French. These were joint exercises which took place in the Java Sea. After this, uh, HMS Albion sailed right through the Paracel Islands. The UK has taken a position that China has, uh, China's drawing of baselines around the Paracel Islands uh, is an infringement of um, the law of the sea, that it can't declare the waters within the islands to be China's internal waters. So the UK made a fairly bold move for its, uh, in it, you know, by comparison, and sailed right through the Paracel Islands and declared that it was uh, following international law. It was challenged uh, forcibly by, by the Chinese uh, military. But we're seeing other countries joining in. We've seen transits by the French, Australian, Canadian, and other navies. Um, Australia and the UK have a, are, are not quite so aggressive, shall we say, as the US in the sense that they, do, they tend to keep more you know, outside 12 nautical mile territorial seas, I think. But there are other points on which they want to make an issue. And I think the Paracels is, is an interesting case. Um, and it's worth looking, I think, before, in case people think that this is some kind of um, external um, initiative without support from uh, local governments, 
These are quotes from the Defence Minister's speeches at the Shangri-La conference this year. So Lick, Mr. Lick uh, from Vietnam, Sabu from Malaysia, and Lorenzana from the Philippines all clearly said that they were in favour of US freedom of navigation operations continuing. Um, worth noting that the Singaporeans uh, didn't say so publicly, but we understand that they are. Neither did the, neither did the Indonesians. But we can kind of, I think, we, we can be fairly confident that the ASEAN states, you know, support uh, international presence and they support the freedom of navigation agenda. Um, I want to just put one little caveat in, which is I think that a lot of the debate around FONOPS has taken us away, I think, from the main issue. For, for Southeast Asian countries, what they're really concerned about is the exclusive economic zone rights. Um, FONOPS are a necessity to kind of keep everybody uh, legal, but in themselves, they don't answer the, the main addresses. The main, the, they don't address the main points. Um, so, for example, whether a particular feature is a rock and therefore entitled to a territorial sea or a low tide elevation and therefore not entitled to a territorial sea, these are important points, but I don't think they are the main point um, for, you know, for the states around. Or, I mean, for example, if a, a British sailor were to die on some freedom of navigation voyage because the UK decided that Gavin Reef North didn't deserve a territorial sea, I think the British government might be hard you know, pressed to explain that to the domestic public, for example, whereas I think there are bigger questions which, you know, for example, conservation of fish stocks and so forth, um, uh, these kinds of things which may enjoy more public support back home. Turn now to questions about sort of balance of power, and I'm aware that other people may look at this in, in more detail. Um, as you have heard already, uh, China has more or less finished the construction of seven artificial islands. Uh, three of which are very large with uh, three kilometer long runways and four are much smaller. The, the smaller ones seem to be more dedicated towards sort of sensor platforms, radar, um, possibly undersea surface um, uh, un, uh, kind of detection um, missions. Um, one thing we haven't seen yet is the deployment of a Chinese attack aircraft to these um, runways. We've seen civilian jets land, we've seen military transport planes land, but we haven't seen um, uh, attack aircraft uh, land there yet. And it may well be that China is waiting for some example of a perceived provocation, a particular freedom of navigation operation, for example, and then we'll make a great uh, show of flying fighter jets down to these islands and, and, and portraying it as a response to some kind of American intervention. Nonetheless, we're seeing anti-ship missiles and surface-to-air missiles being deployed on these islands. The Philippines has been trying to repair its one runway uh, on Titu Islands, and you can see how badly decayed the runway has, been, has become and has been um, doing a small amount of repair work um, and has built a, a, a ramp to get construction uh, materials on there. Um, in response, uh, China has massed uh, huge numbers of uh, uh, ostensibly fishing vessels, but in reality maritime militia vessels around T2 Island to try and intimidate the Philippines uh, away from, uh, from uh, repairing this runway. Um, China's approach here is really, rather than um, you know, actively forcing uh, the other claimants off their islands is to impose some kind of siege so that conditions become so bad that these countries, uh, uh, marines or whatever they are on the islands would, you know, would be forced to leave, of course, and then the idea, I guess, would be that China would then occupy them. We saw this with the, uh, the second Thomas Shoal a few years ago. We're seeing it now with, with, with T2 Island. Um, so it's kind of a... Um, what, what uh, Pierre called this cabbage, cabbage strategy, the idea that you have layers of leaves around it with nominally civilian vessels and then Coast Guard and military in different layers around it, um, acting in, in, a, in a coordinated manner. Um, a quick nod towards you know, possible uh, future developments uh, in the South China Sea, things that we might wish to uh, think about and think about how governments might respond. I mean, I think for me there are, you know, there are, the, the real threats to peace and security in the South China Sea are those states which refuse to compromise on, on the territorial claims. 
Um, I mean, it's clear that you know, all of the states that have occupied uh, features believe that they have well-founded territorial claims, um, yet the assumption is um, that China is the only one left which has the intention to occupy more features. The, other, the ASEAN states have broadly agreed that they are going to recognize one another's holdings informally. That was the purpose of the, the Declaration on the Code of Conduct, uh, which is now nearly 20 years old. Um, uh, China, it would appear, has the ambition to reclaim every single rock and reef in the South China Sea. And the question you have to ask is, well, with these seven huge bases, would, the, would China be made any more secure by having an eighth base? I, I would argue that it doesn't gain anything from that. So therefore, the desire to uh, occupy every single feature um, is really a, you know, driven by a, a sort of a, 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 an internal nationalism. Uh, claims to historic rights that China has some kind of rights that go beyond those written down in UNCLOS and therefore can claim some proportion of uh, all the oil and gas and fish in the entire South China Sea, regardless of UNCLOS. These are obviously clearly another threat to, to peace and good order. And a new argument which is emerging from China that even if the individual features are not large enough to claim an exclusive economic zone from, that if you put them in groups, that collectively they can generate an exclusive economic zone. Uh, this seems to be another, another legitimation for, um, for, for further poaching. Um, these are areas which I think are possible sites where China may attempt to build in the future. Um, Macclesfield Bank is an area of shallow sea. Uh, wouldn't be too hard to put some kind of oil rig type structures there. Scarborough Shoal is an obvious one. Um, it would be the third point of a triangle that could control basically the entire South China Sea, Scarborough Shoal, Paracels and, and the Spratlys down in the south. The James Shoal right down near Borneo I think is interesting because uh, it is officially the southernmost point of Chinese territory, even though it doesn't exist. There's no territory there. It, it was um, claimed by China because of a translation error back in the 1930s. Um, it's actually a piece of shallow sea, 22 meters deep. Um, nonetheless, Chinese schoolchildren are taught that this is the southernmost point of Chinese territory, and so you could imagine this would be a very patriotic gesture to actually go and establish some kind of uh, post there. Obviously, the Malaysians would be extremely unhappy along with the other ASEAN states. And interestingly, this map, which was broadcast on Chinese television, um, is either a giant mistake or could possibly tell us something about the direction of thought in thinking in China. You'll see that the South China Sea is, is very red, and what the, what the designer here has done is colored in everything, including underwater features that China claims as territory. So is this because they don't really understand and they were you know, working off a bad map? Or is this some way of you know, a kind of a step towards the idea that China would actually claim underwater features in the South China Sea um, as territory? Um, something else I think we possibly need to think about is whether in the context of you know, Taiwan uh, PRC relations that uh, China might consider a move against one of the Taiwanese held features, Ituaba down in the Spratlys or potentially even Pratas uh, much closer to the Chinese coast. Um, they're both defended by armed coast guards but um, uh, whether they could hold out for long um, it would, is, is in doubt. Um, it would certainly be a test for the United States as to how it would respond to something like that. I imagine that the ASEAN states would probably sit on their hands at that point, um, even though it would be you know, clearly against their wider interests. Um, what chances are there for conflict resolution? I am generally very skeptical about the code of conduct talks. Uh, the code of conduct talks began with discussions in Manila in 1996 between China and the uh, Southeast Asians. Uh, Last November, Li Keqiang, the Chinese Premier, said the talks might take another three years. Well, that would be 25 years since the discussions began. So the idea that uh, this is going to come to some conclusion anytime soon, I think, is um, uh, optimistic at best. The same issues keep coming round and round and round. China only wants to talk about the Spratlys. Vietnam wants to talk about the Paracels. Philippines wants to talk about Scarborough Shoal. China says no. Um, most of the ASEAN states want the text to be legally binding. Whatever that means, China again says no. China has thrown in a few other things. For example, it wants to have a right of veto over any military exercises that the coastal countries do 
uh, with outside powers, um, and that would obviously be against the interests of pretty much all the Southeast Asian states. So, you know, these talks are going to go on and on and on. Obviously, it's better that people are talking rather than fighting, but I don't put too much hope in the COC process myself. Um, I think what would be interesting as a sort of new approach maybe is to look at actually tackling the underlying territorial disputes, um, actually looking at who is the, the rightful owner of every rock and reef. In general, historically, people have seen that this would be an impossible task, that the, it's just simply far too complex. I argue that actually it would be relatively easy because states have been actively propagandizing you know, the nature of their claim for the last 30 years or so. So we have a lot of evidence in the public domain about the examples of when countries you know, landed on certain islands and stuck their flags in them and so forth. And it would be possible, I think, to go through a process of disaggregating the claims and saying simply because you own one reef doesn't necessarily mean you own the one next door to it. And we have a precedent here in the dispute between Malaysia and Singapore, and you can see how close these features are to one another uh, in the Malacca Strait, and yet the International Court of Justice was able to rule that you know, some one belongs to Singapore, some two belong to Malaysia, and then the third they left um, indeterminate. So um, you know, the same kind of model could be applied to the Spratleys, the Paracels, and so forth, I believe. So I think, in general, uh, international community needs to look quite hard at how it can defend legitimate claims to exclusive economic zones, um, how the Philippines and Vietnam's rights to the oil and gas and fish and the other resources can be protected. Um, uh, individual, if in the absence of, of regional agreements, we need to look at how individual states can be encouraged uh, to operate on their own but in coordination with, with other countries. Um, and I think it's time to engage with the underlying territorial disputes, which are the, the main motivation, uh, in the, for the, certainly for the Chinese actions in the South China Sea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. So you have actually set the, already the main points of the existing disputes, mainly maritime and also, of course, uh, because it's linked to the maritime claims, the claims on the islands or artificially built islands. Uh, I just want to remind the audience that regarding the Huangsha, the Paracels Islands, uh, they were invaded by the Chinese troops already in 1974. Not completely, but a big part of those islands are now occupied by the Chinese forces since 1974. And at that time, they have ousted uh, partly the forces of the former South Vietnamese army. Uh, since then, part of the Paracels are occupied by the Chinese and part by, still by the Vietnamese. Um, so linked to all these maritime issues, there are also claims regarding specific islands. And of course, uh, the Vietnamese government uh, bases its claims on mainly uh, Paracels on former French maps since uh, Vietnam has become a uh, French colony uh, and, and the French have drawn, all, they have drawn all the limits of Vietnam, the border between China and Vietnam and the issue of the islands to whom they, those islands belong has been at that time uh, decided by the French. And when they left, when the French left, of course, the Vietnamese governments, North and South, recognized those uh, French borders, which at that time had been internationally recognized. But obviously, the position of China is a different one, and uh, they want to apply their own laws. Uh, now we have Professor Eric Franks, of Brussels, uh, 
we'll talk about the potential impacts of international law on these uh, Ch South China Sea disputes. Thank you, uh, Professor Franks. Thank you very much. I would like to start out by thanking the organizers for having had the kindness to invite me here today. Um, I think I'm the only international lawyer on the panel today, um, and probably also in the audience. So, uh, fine. <laughs> nice nice to, to meet you, Professor Kolb. Um, so, uh, the, the, the focal point of my uh, intervention will indeed be uh, on trying to see what has happened since the uh, 2016 arbitration and see how it influences the arbitration itself uh, and how one has to read it. And for that I uh, propose a legal update on uh, five points that I think are of interest. And these are the points. First of all, there is a little, uh, specific relationship between China and Russia which seemed to be very uh, close at the beginning, but which is uh, little by little uh, taking different directions, I would say. Um, there is a critical study that was already mentioned by, uh, by the previous speakers. There is also the draft code of conduct, where I will spend a few uh, words on. Um, then we had the ILA, the International Law Association's Baseline Committee, and how the Chinese reacted to the, um, the outcome of that committee. And finally, um, and this might be, seem far-fetched at the beginning, I would like to take you to the Arctic because I think there are some lessons to be learned on how China is behaving in, um, in other areas, whereas uh, when it comes to its own coastline, it has apparently totally different approaches. And with that, I will try to draw some conclusions. So let's start with the, uh, what I intend to do. Uh, as already stated, it was very clear from the beginning that China did not like the arbitration. Um, it stated that it was null and void, it was no binding force at all, and it has kept that, at least officially, that position and that line up till now. The purpose of the presentation is to try to indicate to you that this has to be read against the background, which might uh, be indicative of a much more nuanced uh, kind of position China, um, or the, this China, this Chinese better, uh, statements have to be framed in. And in order to do that, uh, let's try and see how China and Russia found each other and today, I would say, are uh, losing each other uh, in a certain extent. Because right uh, in preparation of the award, uh, China was trying to muster international support for uh, bashing it, um, even before it was uh, announced. And at that time, they found a very willing partner in, in Russia. Uh, the uh, two heads of state had a joint uh, declaration uh, on the promotion of international law. That was 25th of June 2016, so a few days or a few weeks before the arbitrational um, award. And it was stated um, that according to these post partners, uh, that dispute settlement is very important, but it needs to be based on consent. And of course, the consent in this case uh, cannot be doubted because um, uh, once you are signed up to the International uh, Convention, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, you automatically sign up also to the dispute settlement part. Uh, it further read that you have to use it in good faith, uh, this, uh, and also in a spirit of cooperation. Uh, this one can still understand, but the last part is, of course, rather specific, because there the post heads of state stated that the purpose shall not be undermined by abusive practices. Now, in later uh, statements by the Chinese authorities, you very often read uh, good faith and also abuse of power or abuse of rights uh, as an argument for not uh, living up to the um, award. So this was 2016. And mainly this was because of the Arctic Sunrise uh, arbitration in which we ourselves were a little bit involved because we were defending the, the Dutch uh, government here in their fight against Russia. 
uh, Russia had seized one of the Greenpeace vessels, which had a, a Dutch flag uh, off uh, an oil platform in the Arctic. Um, and um, the Dutch were of the opinion that this was arrest was illegal and the detention was illegal. Um, and so they uh, started a Annex 7 arbitration like the Philippines did against China. Now, also in this arbitration, one saw that uh, the decision on the merits had been reached about a year earlier. So uh, the, the Russians very well knew what it was all about. And in this arbitration, also Russia uh, refused to participate. And I would say, uh, again, to their detriment, because the award was uh, all uh, unanimously uh, against the interests of Russia. So if we take a little uh, uh, overview of how these two Annex 7 awards relate to each other, you will see that the Philippines one started earlier, 2013, but that uh, the awards on jurisdiction and also on the merits of the Netherlands versus Russia, the Arctic Sunrise case, uh, came in earlier, about a year earlier always than the Chinese-Philippine one. Um, the only difference between the two is that the award on compensation in the Arctic Sunrise case was given uh, in 2017. That closed off the case, and you will see that today uh, on, it has been uh, taken off from the, uh, uh, the website of the Permanent Court of Arbitration as a case still pending. And uh, the position papers is also very important because if parties do not participate, how does the tribunal know their views? Uh, China has been very uh, inventive in the sense that they uh, drew up a legal argumentation, at least with respect to the uh, award on um, jurisdiction, because they were so sure to win that. Um, and they did it in due time. You will see 2014, that is quite a, uh, some time before the award was rendered. Russia, uh, unfortunately, did the same thing. But if you compare the dates here, uh, it was totally useless for Russia to do so because they wrote their uh, legal arguments only days before the award was rendered. And so the, what the uh, uh, arbitrational tribunal did was simply said, yes, yes, we saw your paper, but there's nothing new in there. So, uh, and because of the timeline, we simply continue with our decision. So it was a wasted uh, time, I would say. So this is a framework in which I think both countries found each other uh, in the beginning. But since then, much has changed. Um, much has changed because in the meantime, um, there is apparently a change in strategy. Uh, you know that Russia has had trouble uh, with Ukraine. And since uh, the Crimea crisis, um, a lot of um, uh, incidents have occurred and a lot of uh, disputes about the, uh, the Sea of Azov and also the Strait of Kerch. Um, and uh, the Ukraine, Ukraine took another uh, decision to introduce a Annex 7 tribunal. And this tribunal, uh, instituted uh, of the proceedings, took place in 2016. It's only uh, months after the South China Sea award. And here Russia took a totally different position because they did appoint an arbiter, which in the past cases had not been done. So it was Golitsyn, a former president and judge of the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, which was appointed. And also, um, after the tribunal decided to bifurcate, and what is bifurcation? It means that you split up the uh, decision, the award on the merits, and the award on the jurisdiction. Um, this was done in August 2018. Uh, after the order, one can see that uh, even though the submissions are uh, still not in the public domain, um, one can read through the order that Russia has put up a strong argumentation, legal argumentation, and is fully participating. And also, uh, these oral proceedings, they will take place now next week um, in The Hague. So we will see how this will evolve. But also, um, I would say that uh, Russia is of the opinion that, of course, there is a lack of jurisdiction. Now, this is not the only case. Uh, there has been a second case uh, after the uh, uh, naval incident, which occurred this time between war vessels uh, of the two countries. Um, the incident took place on uh, November in November last year. Uh, it hit the news quite uh, prominently, I would say, uh, because Russia opened fire on three uh, Ukrainian vessels and then simply captured them and uh, detained the crew and the, and the vessel. Uh, another 
arbitration was instituted by, an, again, an ar Annex 7 arbitration by Ukraine. Um, it took place on, in March of this year. Um, not yet clear whether the Russian Federation will participate or not. Um, Ukraine, uh, in the meantime, like in the Arctic Sunrise case, asked for provisional measures, and you can do that not before the arbitration, because the arbitration tribunal is not yet established. So they, you can do it before the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. Um, and here we'll see that um, they decided not to participate. So again, it seems to be a regression, but without prejudice to the participation in subsequent in the subsequent arbitration. Again, again here, Russia was very sure that the arbitration uh, would have no jurisdiction, so that they could not look into the merits of the case. And why not? Because military activities normally are always excluded from. Um, the uh, part 15 of the UNCLOS. Uh, in this case, uh, however, we see that it lost when they have to render their decision on the provisional measures or the award, the order of the uh, provisional measures. They have to see prima facie, so at first sight, whether are, there is jurisdiction or not. And to the surprise, I think, of the Russians, uh, this tribunal in May this year, so uh, last month, they decided that uh, the activities which took place were not military activities, but law enforcement activities. And for that reason, they could, even though it was war vessels who did them, they were not uh, military actions. It was mere uh, law enforcement activities. And so they said, yes, uh, probably there is a reason, or you can reasonably suppose that there might be a, a jurisdiction in this case. So they then consequently adopted provisional measures saying that Russia had to release and the ship and the people on board the ship. The first reaction of the, on the website of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia now was that, and I quote, in the course of the subsequent arbitration proceedings, we logically intend to defend our position, including the lack of jurisdiction. So it seems, at least, that Russia is again participating uh, or will participate in the second arbitration, Annex 7 arbitration, as well. Why? And I would say um, it, it's very easy. Uh, we, uh, when you plead against a party which has no representation, it's very easy to convince a tribunal in one way or the other because there is nobody giving you a legal argumentation against, against you. Uh, the only thing that you have to do is come up with some kind of legal argumentation that the other party could put forward, but of course this is uh, as to your liking. So I, I don't really think it's very useful for a party not to appear when you agreed uh, normally to um, Annex 7 arbitrations. Let's then turn to the critical study. It was already mentioned in 2016. Um, uh, the award was not in favor of China. It's the, the, the least you can say. Uh, defense put up by China was to criticize the award. How do they do that? Uh, by initially making the denigrating remarks, not only to the arbitration itself. Uh, it was US mounted. Uh, statements by high Chinese officials have already been mentioned, scrap of waste paper, political farce, uh, but also against the arbiters themselves. Uh, it was not up to five people to develop international law. Now, anybody studying international law knows that some of the most important cases in the development of international law has been uh, given by arbitrators who sat on, the on an arbitral tribunal by themselves. So sole arbiters, um, so why not five people? Um, one can question inconsistencies with individual uh, previous writings. So they, they went back to what these people, these five people on the bench had been uh, stating in the past and they said they are not consistent. And then also statements by high level Chinese lawyers. And here uh, I would like to quote the, uh, uh, the judge of the uh, Chinese judge on the International Court of Justice who stated of their colleagues, uh, I will not, and I quote, I will not say the arbiters are biased, but they are ignorant, um, and others compare the, uh, even uh, the arbiters with Hitler in the sense that um, this is a, a, a bunch of people who simply decide what they want. There is no control over what they say. Um, but I can tell you that this argument by a legal scholar of China was even rebutted by others, uh, Chinese uh, favored uh, lawyers in the room at that time. So it means that it went quite far. Chinese Society of International Law, it was already mentioned before the award, they started to try to prepare the international public by saying that it was null and void. Uh, 
And their argumentation was, if there is no jurisdiction, you cannot have a, a decent uh, or a valid uh, better uh, decision on the merits. Ex, ex injuria, as they say in Latin, use non oritur, so you cannot have a, a legal uh, something which uh, is born out of illegality. Early conferences uh, co-organized by the Chinese Society of International Law, uh, the one in Hong Kong, just after the award was rendered. Um, it was very strange, but uh, the last panel was a panel uh, with many people uh, all having something to say against the arbitral award. But if you see how they were able to put on the bench, um, it was not uh, quite strong, I would say. You had a former chairman of the ILC, a former deputy legal advisor, uh, of a country, a former judge of the ICJ, and three university professors, and that was about it. So uh, I would say it, it showed already at that time that international um, support for their action was not really high scale. And then let's come to this critical study. For me, it's a, a, a really um, interesting piece of work. Why? because it was first of all published in the Chinese Journal of International Law, so I can say yes, this is uh, at least a legal, it's not political, but now we will see the legal argumentation. But the problem with it is, is that if you read it very carefully, um, it is a special edition because it was, as we will see, very long, but also the author is the Chinese Society of International Law. Um, a Chinese society, so one uh, abstract body writing 540 pages of legal argumentation, very uh, detailed. One wonders how this is done. Um, they try to explain because they say, the, and I quote, it represents the position of the Chinese Academia of International Law uh, on the award. So it means that apparently in whole China, you don't find any legal scholar who has something other to say against the award than what is in these 400, uh, 540 pages. And then they even give you a listing. Now, I myself am the uh, president of the Belgian Society of International Law. Of course, I don't want to compare the Belgian Society to the Chinese Society. We are very much uh, more limited in number. But at a particular moment in time, we tried to um, have a common statement. And it was a plea against the abuse at that time of the invo invocation of the, cell the right of self-defense as a response to terrorism. And what we did was we tried to have a two-page note, so very succinct, because of course you try to find a text which is acceptable to most people, and then you have to cut uh, and paste, and it was uh, cut down to two pages. And then if you look at the people who subscribed it, they're all mentioned by name, and uh, I, I have it, the first one and the last one, and it will, uh, I think it will strike you, they're not Belgians, right? So we had to look outwards. And I can assure you that not all Belgian colleagues were uh, signing up to this declaration. So it means that if you, even if you have a small society of international law, you always have dissent within your ranks, right? So it's very unusual to have a 540 pages of detailed legal argumentation, which is carried by a uh, large group of people. So two questions seem to uh, need to be answered. The first one is, how representative is this, all this uh, comparison with the U.S. legal community at the time of the Nicaragua case, which was somewhat similar before the ICJ, it was not before an arbitration, but the U.S. refused to participate after the jurisdiction phase. Now, in U.S. legal uh, scholarship, there were more people, I would say, who were against the position of the U.S. at that time than there were uh, U.S. lawyers defending the U.S. government position. How independent is the Chinese uh, Association of International Law? That is the second question from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, because if you look at the statute of the Chinese Society of International Law, it will tell you that there is a link because they carried out this work under the supervision and the leadership of the foreign ministry. Um, so it, apparently a very close link. And also uh, what they did with uh, how they did try to make sure that everybody knew that this was a bad award. Well, they simply um, ask their community to organize conferences, and the Hong Kong one is a good example, to organize domestic experts and scholars to write response to, um, on the award, and also uh, even um, uh, instigate people to write negative things about the award, 
Uh, this was done mostly towards their own uh, scholars, but I can assure you it was also done with Western scholars, uh, which were then told that there was still some money available if you would like to do that. All this to simply say that um, uh, this apparently uh, was received, uh, all these uh, uh, negative aspects about this uh, society was received by the uh, authors, and they in some kind had a rebuttal, because the editor-in-chief at that time, Professor Yi, uh, in a, one of the uh, following issues of the Chinese Journal of International Law, tried to explain, because he said some commentators apparently are concerned about the status of the author, the Chinese Society of International Law, and he explains the review process, which of course nobody doubts, and I can assure, because I've published also in the Chinese Journal of International Law, this is peer-reviewed, so it means you receive critics, you have to adjust, but not to the substance, but at least uh, if there are Ill, uh, they try to, to, to improve the piece, and to that extent I can assure that this is a high-level uh, journal, but they don't explain, of course, how you can have for uh, so many people writing um, a legal argumentation of so many pages. Uh, it's a collective effort. All national societies, they say, they defend their national positions. It is true. Everybody is biased by his own national uh, country, but, of course, to say that and to be unanimous, that is quite some different things, and some comments also drew attention to the description of the society in the charter, and here the response was very Luke, I would say. They said, well, the language of the charter really defies proper rendition in English because it's so uniquely Chinese. Well, of course, this can be an argument to deny anything. Um, if we then turn to the uh, code of conduct, here I can be very brief because Normally, you can say nothing about this code of conduct, which was adopted in, uh, during the month of August 18, because it's uh, totally secret. You cannot receive a document, but in the press, of course, uh, things were leaked. Um, what we can say is that uh, as far as dispute settlement is concerned, this is really a part of the D DOC, which still has to be worked out, because there are quite different opinions about it. Um, and of course, China does not want to have any uh, dispute settlement other than negotiations. Now, this is very important because this was one of the arguments that China raised with respect to the um, uh, Philippines arbitration. They said that the DOC, uh, the, the uh, Declaration of, of Conduct, yes, the DOC, uh, was a, uh, already an agreement between the parties not to bring it before international arbitration. So I would advise the parties to be very, very careful, even if they still have time to think about it, if they still will take another 10 years before this uh, COC will be concluded, uh, to be very careful what kind of uh, provisions are in there uh, concerning dispute settlement. And then duty to cooperate, it's very interesting to see, it was already mentioned, uh, foreign war vessels, at least that is China's position, should not be able to go into the area uh, without their consent, but also for uh, economic uh, cooperation, they said it should be done between the um, uh, and only between the parties in the region. So what China wants to do is keep it all within the family. If we then turn to the International Baseline Committee, here uh, I would say uh, this committee has been working for some time. Uh, in 2012, the mandate was expanded, and um, uh, also straight baselines were involved. So here we start uh, running into the South China Sea because, of course, the parasols um, baseline, which were already mentioned, when our report was finally submitted, and I'm a member of that committee, uh, it was very clear. It was one paragraph saying that, well, if you read the cases, uh, the case law and the arbitration, there can be no other uh, conclusion to be drawn that you cannot draw uh, archipelagic baselines around uh, outlying archipelagos which are not independent states. So you cannot, no matter, no matter who is the owner of the parasols, you can never draw straight baselines, archip better archipelagic baselines around the paracels, and even not straight baselines because Qatar Bahrain will tell you this is impossible. A footnote was attached. Uh, again, it was one person, the Chinese colleague, who said that uh, this could not be uh, correct because in the critical study it had been demonstrated that this today has become a part of international law. Normally, these reports are adopted by consensus. Uh, this report was not because there was a dissent. Uh, it's very unusual in the International Law Association. And again, if you read this dissent, it was uh, saying the same thing. Uh, 
uh, archipelagic baselines are possible. It's part of customary international law at present, according to this argumentation by one person. Uh, and again, uh, they also said, and this is very interesting to see, that they are astonished by the uncritical way in which the association uh, simply uh, relied on the arbitration. Of course, um, having in mind what the, uh, all these society members have done, this is a quite daring statement, I would say. And then coming to the Arctic, um, and with it is the last point. Uh, this is a, our, uh, an area where uh, recent developments have taken place. We today have an agreement to prevent unregulated high seas fisheries in the central Arctic. Um, it was already men mentioned that fisheries in the South China Sea is an important issue. Uh, this was signed on, in October 2018, and as we speak, uh, I think two days ago or three days ago, uh, three countries had already ratified. You need all ten of them to ratify, so it means that we are waiting for seven more ratifications. But what is important is this is a peri uh, an area of high seas beyond the EEZs of the different countries in the area, um, where, and this map will show you, where no fishing had going on as of yet. Why not? Simply because it's ice covered. Uh, the ice you see here is 2016. It was the, the year, the exceptional year, that the ice cover was the least up till now. So it means that most of this area you simply cannot fish because it's, um, it, it's impractical to do so. Now, in order to protect these uh, species, one can ask what has it to do with the South China Sea? Well, um, as we wrote ourselves already in the past, I think if you look at uh, the nine dashed line, and if you think of the sector lines, uh, certain comparisons can certainly be found. But more concretely here, the position taken by China, I think it's very uh, illogical because in the South China Sea, and we just saw with respect to the uh, DOC, COC discussions, they want to keep everybody else out, but with respect to the Arctic high seas fishing, they want to be in and they forced their foot into the negotiations, as we will see in a minute. Because how did it start, the protection of the fish? It started out by the scientific community saying in 2012 that something should be done before it's too late. And then the Arctic Five, which is the Arctic Rim countries, uh, meaning Canada, uh, Denmark, Norway, Russian Federation, and the United States, they took the lead. And they said, OK, we will do that, because in the illusory stat declaration they had said, there is sufficient international law in the area, and we as stewards, we will uh, make sure that international law will be respected in the area. So in 2015, they came up with a declaration in which they said, we will prevent our fishermen from fishing in the area unless there is a regional fisheries management organization which is uh, operational and which has given the green light. There were some other... Uh, interim measures which they agreed upon. Um, but the important element here is that, of course, the five at that time said, OK, we we'll may be considering others to join, but the others have to join consistent with this declaration. So it meant the five were the ones taking the initiative, setting out the, the, the guidelines, and all the others would have to fit in within these guidelines. Now, uh, this proved unacceptable to the other countries involved, and we're talking about China, the EU, Iceland, Japan, and South Korea, uh, fierce opposition was posed. The Icelandic people or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, invited the ambassadors of all the other uh, five countries, the five rim countries, to express their discontent, saying this is impossible. We are also an Arctic nation. We have to have something to say. Uh, these are international waters, so what are you doing uh, keeping out the others? And so also the EU was of the same uh, position, and China, of course, as well. And China, as we will see, finally uh, gained, uh, uh, they were on the winning side, because the 2018 agreement today, if you compare it to the Oslo Declaration, what we will see is that you have four interim measures, they remain the same. But what is new, it's a legally binding document this time, and the following step has already been envisaged, so maybe there will be a creation of a RFMO, but for us important is the relationship between the A5 and the plus five, so the Arctic five and the five others who joined, because this is a relationship of equality. 
The five try to have it the other way around. They try to have a veto power. They try to be uh, in the driving chair. Finally, as the agreement reads now, uh, all the um, uh, references to the Oslo Declaration have been uh, transferred to the preamble. And uh, they all I have, there is no veto power. Everybody has the same power meaning that also that is why you need the 10 ratifications before the treaty enters into force. So everybody on foot of equality, China, fought its way in and is sitting uh, together with the others um, and deciding on what will happen with respect to fish. So this brings me to my conclusions. The main findings are as follows. Uh, first of all, the ununited legal front with Russia seems to be crumbling down. It seems inclined uh, Russia to participate in the latest Annex 7 arbitration and finally agreed to pay compensation to the Arctic Sunrise case. This was, yes, decided uh, a couple of days ago. So even though they did not participate, even though uh, they um, uh, refused to accept the arbitration, they nevertheless now struck a deal with the Dutch government paying compensation for the award. So meaning that even though on the face value they say we are not involved, they uh, finally came down and agreed with the decision because they paid compensation to the Dutch. The critical study and the ILA baseline committee, they both prove, I think, that despite numbers, uh, Chinese position is not mainstream and legal warfare to discredit the award might impress the home front, but impact on the world at large remains doubtful at best. And with this, I would like to end my intervention. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Franks. Thank you very much. Now we will have Dr. Teresa Fallon uh, speaking about China's attitude to international law and norms in the South China Sea, but also talking about uh, the views of the European Union and how Europe's interests may be affected by the South China Sea disputes. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's really a delight and honor to be here. I want to thank uh, Pierre Schiaffarelli for his kindness to invite me here and uh, for your attendance. So, uh, as you can see, challenges to maritime security in Asia and implications for Europe. What does all this mean for Europe? Uh, I will talk about Europe in the South China Sea, in the South China Sea in Europe, EU global strategy, Europe's preventive diplomacy approach, PESCO, and future prospects. So what does this look like to, to you? What does that, does it spark any memories maybe from, some of you are too young, maybe for the Cold War? You could have changed that flag and made it uh, the Soviet flag perhaps. I, I took a photo of this at a conference in Germany uh, about two weeks ago. So this perception that Europe feels pressed between the US and China, this seems to be a growing narrative within the EU. Um, and it has echoes from the Cold War period. So just to remind everybody of Europe's position on the arbitral tribunal decision uh, back in 2016, in diplomatic language, they used the weakest word, acknowledge. They didn't support, nor did they welcome it. And this was largely due to the inability of, of Europe to speak with one voice. So the Greeks and the Hungarians ha had their reasons because of Chinese investment. And also Croatia had its own dispute with Slovenia on a um, maritime border. So. Uh, they also, and this is going back to 2017, um, Donald Tusk, the idea of EU-ASEAN cooperation. So this kind of grouping of middle powers that they can work closer together. So 
um, this idea of ASEAN EU plan of action was counterterrorism, fight against piracy, and then the major issue of illegal fishing. Okay, so briefly, just to give you an over overview of EU-Asia relations, EU is China's largest trading partner. It's also the largest foreign investor in ASEAN. EU's foreign policy interests require the safety of European commerce with Asia. So this idea, you know, what happens in the South China Sea definitely affects what goes on in the European economies. And you, the EU is one of the founding members of ASEAN, so they really want to play that up and a signatory of the Treaty of Amity uh, and cooperation. So the... Uh, this is one of the most important uh, waterways in the world. We understand the geopolitical changes taking place with Asia becoming more and more of an economic player. Uh, and Europe is, is registering all of this. There was a wake-up call in 2010, which of course precedes the arbitral tribunal decision, but I decided to put this in because we're seeing an echo of history now with, in 2019 with the US-China trade war. Whatever happens there can also affect Europe. Uh, in, especially in regards to rare earths, which have been threatened to be embargoed. Um, and this is Fu Ying uh, at the Munich Security Conference in 2016. Uh, she, she had prepared remarks, which were, but this was what she said on this, uh, before she started speaking. There's no such thing as universal values. They are American values. I see you all nodding your head in agreement with me. So this idea of trying to separate Europe from the US saying that universals, which is one of universal values, which is um, as the leaked document number nine, is a threat to the Chinese Communist Party. So this idea of that Europe doesn't really have them, that they're really American values is something I think that Europeans almost find distressing. So psychologically, we see this kind of reframing. I mean, now we're talking about the South China Sea, but this reframing of the Indo-Pacific makes the whole region come closer psychologically to Europe. So um, I think that this is important. So they're becoming more, they see that this is very important for their own future economic safety. And also the, uh, China's first overseas base in Djibouti, that's getting closer and closer to Europe as well. So the revival of the Quad, uh, US, Japan, Australia, and India, this is something that um, France is not a member of the Quad, but they, they would like to do exercises, they cooperate. We see France uh, very active in the region and also Britain and perhaps even Germany. And then of course Japan has used the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which has been adopted also by the US, this FOIP I, uh, idea. And Japan's high level um, cooperation on um, uh, infrastructure is something that Europe wants to work together with in their uh, connectivity strategy. So Europe is playing a bigger role in the region, I would say. And just to highlight how this idea that China is far away, well, actually, they're right in Europe's backyard with the naval maritime exercises in, from the Black Sea in, to the Mediterranean in 2015 and the Baltic Sea, where they had live fire exercises off the coast of Kaliningrad back in July 2017. So, we just recently had the Shangri-La Dialogue last weekend, but back in 2016, uh, French, the then French Defense Minister announced um, how they wanted to have kind of the EU more present in the region. We haven't really seen that gel. We've seen more activity by the French with willing members of European states on these ships, kind of in a symbolic uh, pose. Oh, he also highlighted, I should say, the concerns about the Arctic, as, as Eric Franck uh, just gave a wonderful presentation on and Mediterranean norms. So they, they understand what happens in the South China Sea will be applied also to their own neighborhood, the Mediterranean and the Arctic, and that's a major concern for them. So one of these first kind of coalitions of the willing happened in 2017. A member from the European External Action Service symbolically was also on the ship. Um, it visited, I think Bill went over this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but um, it was kind of a, a unique uh, process. So you had the French ship, you had various Europeans on the ship, a uh, representative from the European Commi uh, External Action Service, plus Britain had two helicopters aboard. So it was kind of this unique pairing of, and a symbol. Of course, uh, how did China respond? Uh, they weren't happy at all. They wanted to nip this in the bud. They didn't have one but two television programs dedicated to uh, knocking this exercise and um, to kind of register their displeasure with this. They don't want to see 
they just would like the narrative to be that the U.S. is there. So when other countries take part, it, it shows that there's more um, international opprobrium with China's behavior. And uh, you can see this is another one. Um, political signal from France and Britain is absolutely directed at China and Russia. So um, there's an interesting quote there from Admiral uh, Yin Zhou. The US has for years been seeking to make NATO into a global NATO. I don't think that's going to quite happen, but this is the, the narrative that um, China is using and kind of warning um, Europe to stay out and putting pressure on them. This is from a, a naval magazine. I just thought it was interested, interesting because you know Europe has been a little slow, but China is very interested in what naval, uh, uh, what China, what Europe has, and they write reports about European navies and they look at this very carefully. Um, okay, I'm gonna just, I, I, okay. So um, back in 2016, there was an EU global strategy. Uh, it didn't get a lot of coverage because, unfortunately, it was published the day after Brexit votes, which got all the media attention. But this was uh, an important update and kind of set the broad guidelines of how the EU, um, they wanted to update and, and show that they wanted to be more of an international player. What the key concepts, some of them were principled pragmatism, that they were joined up and resilient. It hadn't been updated since 2003. So this is really one of the legacies of Federico Mogherini, who championed this. Um, it also recalibrates overall foreign policy posture, and uh, main priority for EU global strategy was to achieve a better balance between soft and hard power in support of clearly de defined geopolitical objectives. So this is all really nice on paper, but the reality is far more difficult to implement with 20, soon to be 27 EU member states. So since then, we've seen a really a massive shift in European perceptions on China, similar to what happened with the US, with the, you know, the, the sudden, um, not sudden, but it was happening over time, this kind of perception shift that China is not going to change. Uh, even after they joined the WTO in 2001, everyone thought you know, they'll, they'll become capitalist and then democratic and everything will be fantastic. So it hasn't worked out quite that way. And um, the sentence, uh, China is a strategic partner, but also a strategic competitor with which we are in a competition of systems. Those are three different concepts in one sentence, but this kind of shows the European uh, way. They're just overwhelmed with, with how they perceive China now. So uh, this idea also in the 10 points that were released before the EU-China summit, that uh, they describe China as a systemic rival, which was the first time we've ever seen this type of language in regard to EU-China relations. So I think this was kind of a turning point. So what has happened since then? Um, Europe is, is bringing more things ahead. So enhancing security cooperation in, Asia, in and with Asia is a, a new policy. Uh, I think it's, it's a positive uh, direction that they're going in, that you, they're, Priorities also include maritime security. There's a lot there, but I'll, I'll focus on the maritime security since this conference covers the South China Sea. But just to give you an idea that they are putting money into these uh, problems and with definitely a focus on ASEAN. So to talk about um, why it's so difficult for such a huge trading partner of Europe to speak with one voice, I'm just going to briefly explore China's economic statecraft in Europe. So I define it as using economic resources foreign aid, trade sanctions, strategic investments to influence policy decisions in other countries. China's not the only country that does this, but I'm just trying to give you a definition. So we, we know about the China's Belt and Road Initiative. This is their official poster. It's red. He's got a little hammer and sickle in the corner there. They're not hiding that fact. Um, he's in his mouse suit. So it's, it's um, both the land and maritime Silk Road. So, what is really distressing for Europeans, this predates the Belt and Road Initiative, but it's a sub-regional grouping carved out of Central and Eastern Europe. So 11 EU member states and five possible accession states. And the investments in this region has been really um, problematic for Brussels. So these smaller states feel very pleased that they can actually talk to uh, Li Keqiang when he comes to, to visit with them. Um, they think there's a bit of hypocrisy because say France or Germany or UK can meet uh, often with uh, Xi Jinping, so they felt that this was an interesting format for them to use. So there's been a lot of promise fatigue, a lot of um, investments never really materialized, 
And what's most worrying is that the five EU candidate countries, especially Serbia, and has been pulled away from joining the EU. So this strategy, uh, this perception that the Balkans are being pulled away by China, as well as Russian investments, is really on the radar back in Brussels. Um, we've seen the investment in Piraeus port. Uh, it has been phenomenal. It's improved dramatically. Uh, it, um, from Chinese investments, but at the same time, it's also bought influence within the EU. So Greece uh, has blocked many statements now by the, the European Commission. It's very difficult for them to issue statements that China does not like. Um, so the political influence, control of assets relevant to, relevant to national security. In Europe, only 50, half of the EU member states have some sort of security FDI screening mechanism, a foreign direct investment screening mechanism. And um, China was investing in ports, railways, airports, kind of the commanding heights of the economy. So uh, there's been a response. It happened really within one year. They announced it in 2018. And by EU standards, it's pretty dramatic how quickly they were able to get it through. But at the same time, it's kind of weak, watered down, and toothless, but it's a start because it's so difficult to get all 28 member states to agree on something. At this point, they can at least review what China's investing in. And if nine member states agree then uh, on something that they think is highly strategic and they're concerned about it, they can actually bring a mechanism to have discussion. But the process is only as good as the member states willing to report or if other member states you know, want to watch what the other ones are doing and then complain about them. So it's, it's imperfect. It's not really similar to the um, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which is also undergoing reform, but we have seen a dramatic decline in Chinese investments. It's for multiple reasons, but I think this concern about FDI screening has also slowed down China's investments, as well as their own slowing economy. So I call this a Silk Road squeeze. We, you know, the, Kissinger famously said, please leave a message after the beep. Who do I call when I want to call Europe? Well, who do you call when you want to block a statement by the EU? There are some state, uh, member states that, we can, that China seems to be able to count on. Um, these investments have really created some problems. Europe is, is uh, as President Juncker, president of the European Commission, uh, Juncker has said, there is no consensus on China. So Europe is almost neutralized. It's very difficult for them to act. So what does this mean now? So we have an EU global strategy printed in 2016. They seem to have got their mojo back with these tough statements, but then they're unable to act because there's no consensus. So they've come up with an interesting approach. So they kind of, the EU issues general policy recommendations, and then they're translated into policy practice by individual member states and groups of member states to work around differences of of opinion within the EU. So what does this mean? Those early examples of you know the friendship to, so there are these kind of coalitions of the willing to kind of uh, show symbolic um, that you know it's important to uphold uh, freedom of navigation. So this is a positive development in my, my view. Otherwise, their hands would be tied. So EU's preventive diplomacy approach, um, but, you know, so this is, all right, uh, so I'll just give you that. They, they like this idea of preventive diplomacy. Um, I don't think it, it's, all right, it's the EU approach, and I want to focus more on the South China Sea here. So what future potential for EU preventive diplomacy within the ARF framework? So we see continued capacity building exercises, sharing of best practices, and capturing of lessons learned. What are the future prospects? Um, demand for closer EU defense cooperation. I don't know if this is really going to get off the ground because um, we see with the UK leaving, things that were kind of prohibited in the past are kind of growing. And also um, the Trump effect. So there's this idea that Europe needs more strategic autonomy. What will this mean for security issues in the Asia Pacific? Um, okay, so we see attempts to set up a European defense union. Uh, the U.S. is kind of ambivalent about this in some respects. They want the Europeans to pay more for their defense, but naturally, if you pay for it, this equipment, you want to be able to use it. So I think uh, they need to have more continued dialogue on this. I think it's very important. So um, we have PESCO, Coordinated Annual Review of Defense, and European Defense Fund. There are a lot of tensions in transatlantic relations these days, so this is something to watch uh, how it evolves. <coughs> 
Um, okay, I already said that. And the other issue is the Euro-Asian Euro connectivity strategy. No one in Brussels will admit that this was a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, but it really was a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, China has been very active, and, and Europe wants to come up with their own high-level, good quality um, connectivity strategy. There's been some overtures towards, towards Japan and some areas that the EU wants to cooperate with China. So we'll see how that works through the Eurasian landmass. Um, okay, so what... Europe needs to help prepare long-term solutions, uh, de-escalatory diplomacy, their environmental protection and fisheries management. They have a lot of lessons learned that they can share with the region and broad economic outreach to ASEAN states. Um, but European concerns, Eric gave uh, the summary of the Arctic. This, as I mentioned, is bringing these issues closer. Uh, Bill Hayton wrote a great piece for Munich Security Conference when he quotes uh, an exchange at King's College London with um, uh, Joe, Joe Bow, Joe Bow, and someone from the audience said to him, uh, you, you pass through British waters in order to come here and speak, but also to do this military, uh, this naval maritime exercise with the Russians. And can you make a comment on that? And he said, well, when I'm in British waters, I follow British rules. And when you're in Chinese waters, you follow Chinese rules. So if this is an indication of how they interpret international law, um, this is a, a kind of a warning shot for Europeans to really pay attention because if this is the rules that they will follow, uh, how will that affect them in the Arctic? So the things that Europe is also concerned about are you know, how these issues, you know, the, the temperature is increasing um, because of tensions between the US and China, so they don't want to be dragged into a conflict, but um, numerous situations they're afraid could spark military conflict in East Asia, despite efforts from parties in the region to maintain peace. Uh, as we know from past experience, accidental collisions at sea or in the air, and misunderstandings caused by cyber attacks and actions taken by third parties like North Korea. So last week at the Shangri-La Dialogue, four years ago, uh, Federico Mogherini stated that the EU would be a, not to just think of them as an economic space, but also to think of them as a defense provider. Four years later, she only talks about North Korea. And in one respect, this could be a symbol of how our hands are tied, because there's such division within the EU Maybe the safest thing to talk about was North Korea. Um, and on a positive note, EU-Vietnam relations, um, May 10th was the first ever joint committee meeting under new partnership and cooperation agreement. So economic relations are improving dramatically uh, with, with Europe, and this also brings culture, cultural ties and people-to-people -people ties. So I think there will be a, a, a blossoming of EU-Vietnamese relations. And it's always important to remember safety in numbers. Middle powers can have an independent influence on deterrence and escalation, and the court of public opinion is important to Beijing. Even if it's one, two, three ships, it, it registers, and I think it's very important for the international community to show that they have an interest in these uh, conventions. Possible new development. When I was at this conference in Berlin uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was about the South China Sea, and I, I was surprised because I would never have expected that. And this was from yesterday's paper, uh, will Germany send, ship, uh, send a ship to the region? This is the big question. Uh, foreign policy making in Germany right now, I, it, in my opinion, we have a German here, he can probably comment with much greater accuracy, but my impression is that it's very fragmented. So there are some advocating that Germany must you know, take a role, must have a position. As the biggest trading partner in Europe with China, uh, I imagine there are some business interests that might be against that. But we've seen um, Germany was a key player in changing the position on China because the BDI, the um, the German Association of Businesses published a paper and literally the language systemic rivals, systemic competitor that was taken and, and used in the EU statement. So Germany tends to lead on this and it'll be interest, interesting to see what this development, what happens with that. Um, so to conclude, Europe has an interest to help build up a robust multilateral and rules-based security order in Asia. It's important for Europe to you know, carry their share of the burden too as well. EU and ASEAN need to respond to Beijing's strategic investments, which create challenges and to cohesion and coherence of these organizations. ASEAN is divided, Europe is very divided. I, I was at a conference um, 
in Hainan and they they decided for the first year to group them together. So I thought, oh dear, they put ASEAN and EU in the same um, bag now that they're able to divide and rule. And EU needs to continue to engage ASEAN on topics relevant to rule of law at sea and maritime security. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Theresa. We now will have a short coffee break. Um, and uh, we will follow in about 15 minutes with the presentation of Dr. Nicola Casarini and Dr. Felix Hajduk. Thank you, and we start again in about 15 minutes. I also greet the presence of Professor Kolb, uh, Professor of International public law specialized, specialist also in territorial and maritime disputes. He has been one of the main speakers of our conference on the same subject three years ago in Geneva. And if later, Professor, you have any questions or remarks, if you stay here, you are welcome. Thank you. <laughs>